Today we are reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took all with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Lord, today, gather us up. Gather us up, those who believe and those who doubt. Those who are on the east side and those who are on the west side. Those who feel abundantly rich and those who feel like they have nothing to give. Gather us to this space of being fed by you. Expand our hearts, expand our hands, expand our eyes, and expand the ears of our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning, stay woke, stay woke. Uh, we have entered into a series this month, a gratitude journey, a gratitude series, of reflecting on being grateful. Um, last Sunday we talked about humility, and today, we're looking at the text wherein it challenges us to stay awake. This week I had a colonoscopy. And to, due to challenges with my colon, it's not the first one I've had. And so I know a few things about what it's going to look like when you have a colonoscopy. But even instead, I read through the literature. And one of the things they say about having a colonoscopy is that they're not going to put you totally under. They're going to give you a mild sedation so that you're kind of in the galaxy, so that you're kind of present, but you're kind of comfortable and that you'll be okay. But my experience has been very different. I was already feeling sleepy with a 6 a.m. appointment. But by the time they gave me my cocktail, when I came to, I was in the recovery room. It's an interesting thing, this thing, mild sedation. I imagine that just four years ago when our elections came around and we voted in 2016 and the next day we woke up, I imagine that some of us felt like we were mildly sedated. We had heard of Donald Trump, but many of us who gravitate towards the left had thought for sure that Hillary Clinton had this. We had concerns, but we thought no way, no way could Hillary Clinton lose to Donald Trump, and we would be electing our first female president. Even though we had seen this person come up through the ranks and beat all the Republican candidates out, we still thought that this election was Hillary Clinton's. I imagine that we were mildly sedated. And then we weren't sedated anymore. <laughs> we were in the recovery room. <laughs> and we were awake. We were fully awake. Sometime when one becomes complacent or just comfortable, one can fall asleep. 
like at midnight when you decide you're going to watch that movie and the movie ends up watching you. Sometimes when we're in that space of feeling okay, sleep can visit us. Sometimes when we feel relaxed and we feel safe and we feel secure, we can gravitate towards sleep. In the text today are 10 bridesmaids who were preparing to meet the bride's groom. They were to meet him at a halfway point of some sort. They took their lamps with them. They did not have flashlights, and so for that time period, they used lamps. And one of the things about lamps is in the base of the lamp for my younger audience was oil. And then there was a piece of cotton that would hang and slowly burn. So five of these women took their lamps, and that's all they took. But five took oil so that eventually when the oil burned out, if it did burn out, they would have more oil to put in. And so these 10 ladies with lamps waited and waited. Somebody knows something about waiting this morning. And they became a little bit comfortable and secure. And the night wore on and it became late and they waited with their lamps. But the text tells us at some point they became drowsy first. And then after being drowsy, they fell asleep. As the bridegroom got closer, there was a shout to wake them up and let them know, hey, the bridegroom is getting close. We don't know who this person was that shouted it, but somebody shouted, they were alerted, and the ladies that had been sleeping with their lamps burning all that time woke up. Now, when they woke up, because their lamps had been burning for some time, they realized that they needed more oil. And so the ladies with the oil nicely poured some more oil in their lamp, and they were set. But the ladies without enough oil turned to the ladies with oil and said, hey, can you help us out? And the ladies said, no, get your own. Go do what you got to do. Go to the place that sells the oil. And I'm like... It's midnight. What kind of 24-hour situation they have, but the text tells us that these five ladies go off to purchase oil, and when they get back, and when they get back, the bridegroom has come, and the five ladies that were ready and wise are gone. And so the text labels these ladies foolish. Imagine how these ladies felt. Imagine how they felt running off to get oil, and now they're back, and they want to get in, and they can't. After the elections in 2016, many of us were depressed and shocked. We tried to revisit what happened. There were all sorts of theories and feelings and emotions, and there was a fog that lingered over many cities. We walked around a little numb at first, but we were awake. You know how it is after you first come out of recovery. The medicine has still got you a little sedated, but you're still awake. And we weren't going back to sleep anytime soon. So this message of being ready, being prepared, is not a bad message. It's not a bad message at all to be ready, to be prepared for whatever. Over in Arizona, a red state, the children of Latino parents in Maricopa County they were awake too. They had been awake for quite some time. They probably had been awake longer than we had been awake. They witnessed the toughest anti-immigration laws in our country against families. They reported not knowing when they left for school if they would see their parents when they returned. They saw how their parents were treated and dehumanized. They knew what it was. They knew what was said about their parents simply was not true. And those kids grew up, and they became older, and they saw how this country had treated their families. And those kids formed grassroots organizations, and those kids helped Latinos to register to vote. Maricopa is 60% of Arizona's population, and while much people were focusing, many people were focusing on Miami and Florida, there were Latinos being organized and registered to vote in Arizona. In fact, all over the United States, folks were ready 
on both sides. People came out to vote, which is a good thing. People exercised their voices, which is a good thing. People prayed, people made calls, people canvassed communities, people were ready. In the words of Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, we were ready, and that felt good. Being ready is a good thing. Being prepared is a good thing. It's good to be prepared. Ask my household. <laughs> Les Brown says most of us miss opportunities because we simply are not ready when the door opens. He says the opportunity of a lifetime comes often. It visits us often, but when it comes and it knocks on our door often, many of us are not ready. You have to keep some oil in your lamp would say Les Brown, the motivational speaker. In his own life, over and over again, he positioned himself to be ready. He was working for this radio station. He wasn't on air, but he could feel himself ready to be on air. He did other jobs assisting around the radio station, but he always kept his eye on being a disc jockey for this station. And then one Saturday afternoon, he went in and rocking Roger, the disc jockey for that day, was on the air and he was drunk. He was drinking and it was getting worse. And Les just kept looking at him because Les was ready. Finally, the general manager calls Les Brown and says, hey, we need to get someone else on the air. Will you call the other disc jockeys and see who's available? And Les said, sure, I'll call them. He simply hung up the phone, waited for a few minutes. A few minutes had passed by that would suggest he had called the other folks. And then he called the general manager and said, none of them are available. <laughs> and then the general manager said, Les, play music, but don't talk. And Les Brown said, yes, sir, I got you. And Les called up his family, said, take out that radio. I'm about to be on a radio station because Les Brown was ready and Les had oil in his lamp and Les went inside the studio and he looked around for a few minutes and then he blurted out this is me LV triple P Les Brown you're playing disc jockey there were none before me and there will be none after that makes me your one and only young and single and love to mingle certified bona fide double qualified to bring you a whole lot of action you see Les had some oil in his lamp and Les was ready. So I have no cross with this biblical message about being ready, but I think we can expand the text today. Here the bridegroom has come. The wait is about to be over. And you mean to tell me five people that had extra oil in their lap can't share? You mean to tell me that those who did not prepare are the ones who are the meat of the message? Maybe like Sankofa, we need to look back just a minute before we go forward. Weren't we raised that those who have more should share with those who have less? Weren't we raised that the more you're given, the more you should give back? Weren't we taught to care for the widow and people that are marginalized and down, that have been beaten down? Doesn't the Bible say, didn't we hear a couple of weeks to take care of the least of these? Doesn't our Bible and our faith shout out to be present with those in need? And now we're just going to turn our back on those who do not have enough oil? Oil is a privilege in itself. And I feel myself, I want to wrestle with this text some more. My baby cousin gave birth to a son five years ago who is autistic. You know, there's a spectrum, but he's more than just a little bit autistic. He's the real thing. He is autistic. She's a single mom of three kids, all under the age of seven, and it didn't work out between mama and daddy, and y'all know how that goes, and she has no job, and he went for surgery two months ago, and he won't eat. And they kept him in the hospital a long time, and she stared there, even though she had two younger siblings, I mean, two younger kids that were at home with her mom, and she's worried. 
She's worried about her son, and because he won't eat the right food, now they have a feeding tube up his nose that he wears around 24-7. And she's been asking for prayer on top of prayer, but she's weary, and she's tired, and she ain't got no oil. And for those of you that think I said something grammatically incorrect, I said it just the way I meant to say it, she ain't got no oil. She's exhausted. And she ain't got no extra oil. And, for you, <laughs> and the bridegroom may come today or tomorrow, but she's not ready. She ain't got no oil. A lot is happening on 53rd Street. I don't know how well you guys have been sheltering in place, but I came out yesterday because I wanted to celebrate and a lot of stuff, and it's not just our church lawn, y'all. All down 53rd, people are selling stuff, people are singing. I mean, a lot is happening. I don't know if it's post-COVID, but 53rd Street is lit. <laughs> and so yesterday I was out here looking to celebrate and looking to have some fun and sat down and ate and listened to this lady singing on the corner who had a wide range repertoire of music, singing folk and country and R&B. And I was like, this lady can sing. And then I got done and I saw a friend of mine, somebody else I've met on 53rd Street, and his name is Lou. And Lou is coal black, and he has this beautiful black hair with pepper, silver in it, and a slender frame. And Lou is homeless for sure. But many times I can find Lou on 53rd Street he has bags, but not too many. He always smiles, and he doesn't have any teeth. And sometimes he's totally present, and sometimes he look like he might be mildly sedated. <laughs> but yesterday, I surprised Lou, and I walked up to him, and I said, hey, Lou! Lou ain't got no oil. And there are many people across America that don't have oil, that live in Atlanta, Georgia, that live in Nevada, that live in New York, that live in Louisiana, that live right here in Chicago, that have no oil. And maybe, maybe if you're honest, maybe you can't be honest with everyone else, but maybe if you're honest with yourself, maybe at times you haven't had oil. Maybe this message is closer and closer to home than you'd like it to be. And you know what I think? I think that we should share our all. Of course, everybody should stay woke. Of course, everybody should be prepared. Of course, everybody should have some of their own all. The way I see it, everybody's got to go to sleep. It's the way God made us. Everybody's got to take a break every now and then. And sometimes I'm reminded by a friend who on the freeway had to push his car because he had run out of gas, that sometimes, sometimes we don't have oil. Sometimes we run out. And sometimes we can't stay awake. And sometimes we are not ready. And sometimes we need breaks. We need help. Last week I heard someone mention they had watched this new series show on Netflix called Queen's Gambit which is a story of a young orphan girl, Beth Harmon, in the 67 Cold War era, who was gifted at playing chess in a world where mostly only men play chess. She had this gift for chess, but she also had this addiction, which was her vice. It becomes clear at some point for her to rise beyond to actually be the winner she is, she will have to, she'll have to tackle this vice in her life. Isn't that true for some of us? In this movie, I learned that the Russians are known for being the best chess players. Different countries are good at different things, but the Russians are known for being the masters, at least in the 60s and 70s, at being chess players. Each time she comes up against this Russian player, she loses. She's also intoxicated, but she loses. And so some of the American chess players back in America try to coach her, try to help her, but she has this vice. And one of the guys that works with her, he says, you know, 
Do you know what's different between an American chess player and a Russian chess player? He says, in Russia, they play together. But in America, we play as individuals. He says, you see, the thing in Russia, when they play a game, their whole team is playing with them. They look at their mistake. They talk together. They play against each other. They encourage each other. They give each other tactics. They play this game together. In America, often we play alone. But the Russian chess player plays together. They work together. They help each other out. They work at their skills together. Perhaps we can learn from the Russian. I would hope that if we saw someone along life's journey, Republican or Democrat, who was having a bad season and there was something we could do about it, we would help one another. I know what it is to be able to loan someone some oil, and it's a good thing when you can give oil. When you can share oil with someone else, that's a good feeling. But I also know what it is to be empty. I know what it is to not be able to see the light ahead. I know what it is to feel broken in yourself. I know what it is to feel like you ain't got no oil. And so, for this month, as we reflect on gratitude, if you've got enough oil, share it. Share it with somebody else. I know there's some of you that have been there too. You might act and look a little proud, but you've been there. You've been in those spaces. And so we are not here to judge people. People judge themselves enough. We are not here to throw salt on people's wounds. Wounds are bad enough all by themselves. And we are not here to be so heavy-handed with judgment and forget that except the grace of God bathe us, there go we. We are here to share our all with others who need it. I reminded you last week that on the Audrain steps set candy and a message, take some and leave some for others. We are here to take all and leave all for others. We are here to be blessed and to share our blessings with each other. We are here to share our vote with those who need it. A friend of mine and many of you, it doesn't matter who wins, but we vote. As my friend said, she turned to her niece and said, I vote for you. You're the one needed and your kids. <laughs> we vote for others in this country who need it. We are here to share our faith with others who need it. Biden, in finalizing his words last night, said, his grandpa says, says, keep the faith. And then his grandma added, spread the faith. We are here to spread the faith with others who need it. We are here to share our resources with others who need it. Yeah, we're here to stay woke for others who need it. Because at some point in our life, we needed it too. So I say share the all. Stay woke and share the all. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, this month we are choosing to be grateful. Sometimes it's not always obvious what we have to be grateful about. But if we just search for a moment, it can overwhelm us that we have so much to be grateful for. I know from my New Orleans friends that a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour can create gumbo. A little bit of oil and flour can be the base of many things, stews. We have so much united in those of you listening to me today. And we have enough that we can share our oil. We don't have to be stingy. We can share our oil. Because to whom much is given, much is required and expected. 
We thank you, Lord, for the resources that you have given to us. We thank you. We are so blessed. Now, in that spirit, be slow to be judgmental. Be quiet. Be graceful. Be merciful. And share your all with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.